Hi, welcome to Antioch Center for the Nations, and we are continuing our series now. This is session seven of Hearing the Voice of God. In our last session, we talked about reacting, responding to His voice, and how many people do not do the will of God or do not hear His voice any longer because they did not obey to begin with. It requires obedience for God to continue to talk to you. The minute that you ignore God and do not do what he says, even though he's spoken to you, he will stop speaking to you. He's not forceful. He's gentle. So we talked about how to make decisions, how to respond correctly, and we saw the two different realms of wisdom when it comes to making choices, when it comes to making decisions. There's man's way and there's God's way. And if you remember, we saw specifically the difference between the, the list of the scribe and the way he saw the heart and the way Jesus saw the heart. In other words, we receive information in the heart. It goes to the soul. We're excited about it with the mind. We meditate on it and do the will of the Lord. But man's wisdom causes the heart to receive, but then understanding, cold calculating. We reason it to death using logistics, and by the time it gets to our soul, we have nothing to be excited about. So therefore, we do not go in our strength to do what God's called us to do, or we hesitate, or we linger. And this is what we are considering in our path as we obey or disobey God. We want to make decisions the right way. We want to react to God's voice. And so I want to talk about that in this session, reaction to God's voice, Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Did you know that God has a perfect will for your life? How do we prove it? How do we live it? How does it become a reality? We will be able to test it and approve. Remember, it says test the voices. Well, when God is leading us to do something, we are required to react to that voice in obedience and offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. And this is our, of course, spiritual act of worship. This is the least we can do and not conform any longer to the pattern of the world. See, the world does whatever it wants. The world does not live by the plan of God. Recently, I was doing a series or I, I taught a message about Jesus' choices where Jesus was confronted by his brothers uh, to not go or stay in Galilee, but to go to Judea and show himself to the others. And they assumed that Jesus wanted to be a public figure. And remember, his brothers didn't believe in him. But the fact is, at that moment that they were telling him to do that, Jesus knew they were trying to dissuade him or get him off course, and Jesus refused to listen to that. He did not conform to the pattern of the world. He said, my time has not yet come. And he said, for you, any time is good. Why? Because they were living by the pattern of this world world. It says, the children of disobedience live under and by the direction of the prince of the power of the air, that is Lucifer himself. If you're not doing the will of God, the perfect will of God, then you're doing Lucifer's will. You say, I'm not doing Lucifer, so I'm doing my own will. Well, your own will is synonymous with Lucifer's will because that's exactly who the devil is. Satan is the one decided to do his own thing in heaven and was thrown out as a result, and now tries to get us to do our own thing. Instead of listening to the command of God to not eat the fruit, will um, was used, the will of Eve in this case, by the deception of Satan, to do her own will, to eat the fruit instead. Well, that's not our spiritual act of worship. And this is what we're talking about, reaction to God's Voice. I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy and the way that God has been so merciful to us, so kind to us, you owe him. Please give your body over to him in sacrifice to serve him. This is your spiritual act of work. This is how we really spiritually show it. We're not conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. So here we see in this actually um, the path to God's will. 
One, offering your bodies a living sacrifice. Two, spiritual act of worship. Three, transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then finally, your perfect will will come. Now let's break that down. Offering your body as a living sacrifice means that you do not put anything else before what he wants. What does he want? What does God want? What does God desire for your life? His will. It starts with your will. To do God's will, you must relinquish your will. This is a sacrifice. Until you are willing to not do your will, you will not do his will. So offering your body as a living sacrifice. The intentions of God, the desire of God for you versus your desire for yourself. Will you do what you want to do? Will you just make your own choices or will you do what God wants you to do? You have to have a line that you cross into sacrifice for this to happen. We have to lay down our life. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and, and dies, it abides alone. So here, it is wholly and pleasing to God when we offer our lives as a response to his mercy. Say, Jesus, because of what you did on the cross for me, you had mercy on me. I now want to give myself over to you fully as a living sacrifice. I heard one preacher say, you know what the pr biggest problem with a living sacrifice is? It keeps crawling off the altar. <laughs> we have to make this commitment every day. Offer your body every day. Say, today, Lord, what do you want me to do? Big and small. Sometimes the Lord's will can be played out and done in five minutes within a 24-hour period. Sometimes it takes more. He will also let you do your will. But we must first put his kingdom we must seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, his right path. And then everything else will be given to us. We will be able to have the blessings, but you start by offering your body as a living sacrifice. I like that it says a spiritual act of worship. It's up to us to give ourselves over to God's plan for our lives, but we need to either do it or get out of the way. The spiritual act versus the carnal act of worship. Carnal act of worship is the placations of worship, the false worship where you say, Hallelujah, yes, Lord, you and you alone, we worship you, I will obey you, Lord. We sing the songs, but when it comes down to it, it's all in the flesh and we don't really obey. So spiritual act of worship is you totally yielding to him. So stop making excuses and obey by doing the next part of this message. We are transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, this is very important. Uh, you may have had elements of your being out of order, like the scribe we just studied. And we saw how the scribe was thinking wrongly, but Jesus was thinking rightly. We need to change. The Word of God, washed in the water of the Word, transformed the renewing of our mind. Our mind has to be changed. We have to be brainwashed by the truth of the words of the Bible because the only other source of living life we have and information outside of the Bible would be logic and man's wisdom like the scribe. And a lot of people do this, but I refuse to do it. I am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is subject to the Holy Spirit and what the Word of God says because this is the path that leads to number four, the perfect will of God. Uh, there is a plan and purpose that God has for you, but it will never be achieved by using man's will and purpose uh, or man's thinking and reasoning, that form of believing. We need to do his perfect will. We respond to that. We obey that. Now, there are different things. Many Christians, many believers out there suffer under the weight of what I call condemnation. But there's a difference between condemnation and conviction. And when it, when it comes to obeying God's voice, when it comes to hearing the word of God and doing what God's called us to do, we have to understand this. So in this section, we're going to be looking at the work of condemnation in the life of the believer and then compare it to the true prompting of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And so I want us to first start by 
um, looking at conviction, and then we're going to look at um, condemnation, and we're going to do a, a comparison here. But first, let me tell you a little bit about God's uh, conviction. The conviction of God, this, the meaning of conviction in a law term, of course, it means to, to, to um, bring a sentence upon you. But conviction comes before repentance. Uh, it's accompanied by a sense of exposure to your error, to your sin, the work of the Holy Spirit, showing you the darkness of the error of your soul. You feel bad about doing something wrong because God wants you to be right. That's called conviction. Uh, conviction can often feel almost like a, a grief, a remorse. Uh, it sometimes does not have clear definition at first. You just know, uh-oh, something's not right. Something's wrong. And when you get that feeling, we call it, I feel convicted. Or maybe you're talking to somebody and you say something offensive to them. They take offense. It hurts them. And you get that feeling, that stressful feeling. But when you have conviction, you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You know why. You figure it out pretty quickly. And so the means of conviction are various. The gospel truth, when you tell someone about Jesus, they will come under conviction. Uh, the law, read or heard, that happened in the Old Testament. You see where people, they read the law out loud because they had forgotten it. And the people threw dirt on their heads and tore their clothes, realized they felt so much conviction when they heard and this, this comes through reflection. Whenever we read the Bible, sometimes we're reading the Bible, we're happy, but we read something that makes us feel, uh-oh, that's conviction. That's conviction. And it's a beautiful way that God teaches. It's a way that we hear His voice. We receive the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a convincer. That's, in fact, another way of saying conviction just means convincing. He's convincing you that something's not right and you need to make it right. Now, we live, I live by conviction. However, now, there is also a counterfeit of this, another word that we think of as condemnation. In fact, there are four different Greek words for condemnation in the New Testament. These words are translated differently in the Bible, but pieced together, they give us a view of the overall meaning or concept that is condemnation. It is a judging and sentencing of someone without hope. It's judgmentalism. So judgmentalism condemns. And its hypocrisy is seen in someone bringing judgment on another, although he himself is guilty of similar errors. You have no excuse, old man, you who condemn someone else or judge someone yet do the same thing. So the concept of condemnation in the church is, is a poison. It's a very it's common actually in the churches that we condemn each other, we browbeat each other, and we exercise this condemnation over our brothers and sisters to try to manipulate them. Many churches operate by using condemnation to control its members. They create a system of rules instead of allowing God's Spirit to direct. When someone disobeys a rule, clothing, personal preferences, certain conduct, the leaders strictly condemn the individual, ostracizing them. And if it is a bad, if it's a detrimental thing they're doing that hurts someone or hurts something, of course, within reason, we need to have laws and rules. But in religion, condemnation is making you feel guilty about something. And, and this is law. Law is condemnation. The Old Testament is condemnation. The New Testament is conviction. So there are contrasts. And too often we respond to condemnation as if it were the voice of God. It's extremely important that we learn to truly discern the difference between condemnation and the conviction of God. So that's why I want to show you this simple chart that illustrates the difference. We have two categories here when condemnation comes upon us that comes from man and Satan and self, and then conviction. Remember when we learned in the beginning of this course, we looked at the origins of voices, remember? And we talked about it can come from God, from Satan, or from man. Well, when God speaks, it is conviction, always conviction. When the devil speaks, it is condemnation. When man speaks, it is either justification of sin or condemnation. Usually when we speak to ourselves, we're justifying, but we can also be self-condemning, like 
uh, we see stories in the Bible, or like often happens, but men can condemn us. But how do we, what are the feelings of these two things? Because they seem a lot alike, but yet they are very contrasted. And this list of the attributes of condemnation versus the attributes of conviction will help you to discern the voice of God. Because if you feel any of these feelings when you are hearing what you think is God speaking, if you feel the things under the list of condemnation, it's most likely not the voice of God, but the voice of a stranger. But if you feel the things listed here under conviction, then most likely it is God's voice. So let's talk about condemnation. Condemnation we see cold, because it is, it's cold. Judging is cold. Judging, uh, that, that cold feeling that comes versus what? Versus a hot feeling. Conviction is hot. It's a warm feeling. When God speaks, did not our hearts burn within us? When the Lord is bringing conviction upon you, you will feel a warm feeling come over you. Condemnation judges you. It points a finger at you and tells you, you're wrong, you're wrong. It judges you. It puts a standard on you. It puts a measurement on you. It, it, it weighs and measures you and finds you wanting. But conviction corrects. Conviction warmly comes upon you and brings a redirection. It brings correction. There's a big difference between judgment and correction. So correction is to fix you. Now, condemnation, the third thing, leaves you without solutions. Yeah, condemnation is not coming to help you get any better. Uh, it's what Jesus described when the Pharisees travel land and sea to make proselytes of the Gentiles and turn them into Jews and put upon them heavy burdens of laws and do not lift even one finger to help them with that burden because they condemn them. They put condemnation over them to control them that leaves you without solutions. But conviction, when it's God's voice, the Holy Spirit at work in your life, it always gives you a way out. Every test, every trial, there's a way of escape. And the conviction of the Lord will, will gently bring you there. Condemnation is confusing. When you're under condemnation, you don't know what to think. You don't know whether to turn right or left, go forward, go back. You have a headache. You don't understand. You're wondering what to do. You're confused. But conviction is consoling. It's, it's holding your hand. It's not confusing you. It's putting an arm around you. Feel the Holy Spirit put his arm around you and lead you. Condemnation is depressing. After a while of not having any solutions and being confused, you just get frustrated and depressed. But conviction is exhorting. It lifts you up, makes you feel like there is hope. It gives you hope of a better tomorrow. Depression comes when condemnation gives you no solutions because condemnation is destructive. It will destroy you. It will even cause you to destroy yourself. Condemnation it brings this this progression from depression even into self-destruction, uh, which is suicide. But conviction is constructive. It builds you up. It lifts you up. And then finally, condemnation is evil. Conviction is good. So when you get a feeling and you're wondering, is this God speaking to me? Ask yourself which one of these characteristics is most like if you if this voice you're feeling if this message you heard preached if this prophet is prophesying to you and it feels cold judging it leaves you without a solution it's confusing and depressing and destructive then it's evil it's condemnation don't listen to it it's the voice of the stranger but if this message this prophecy this teaching uh, this this thing you read whatever if it's hot correcting you, giving you a new way out of your problems, consoling you, holding your hand, exhorting you, constructing, building you up, then it's good. That's conviction. And that's the way God operates. The voice of God is our vital link to his direction for our lives. As we learn to hear his voice, we will grow as his followers and become more obedient to his instructions. The more we hear, the more faithful we will become. So thus far we've seen three basic sections, right? 
um, the, we started with the responsibility of hearing God's voice. It's up to you. You have to test the spirits and see whether they're of God. It's your responsibility. Don't have somebody else speak firm from God for you. You have to discern for yourself. The sheep recognize his voice. That's the second section we saw, recognizing his voice. We learned its characteristics. He speaks in gentle whispers. It's, it's, it comes in thoughts. It matches the Bible, the second characteristic as we recognize. It always matches God's word. We saw that it, it, it burns within us. And then finally today in these, uh, this lesson and before that, we were talking about reacting to his voice. We saw our responses to his voice. We saw how um, the steps to his will to, uh, to approve and hear and see and know his perfect will for our life, what we have to do, uh, that we're offering your body as a living sacrifice. It's your spiritual act of worship, transforming your mind, the renewing of your mind so that you can think how God thinks. That's how you find the will of the Lord. And we saw the difference between condemnation and conviction. Let us all be under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I pray for the conviction of the Holy Spirit to be upon us. Let that warm, brooding, loving, exhorting, consoling, uplifting spirit of the living God be upon us. And as we are in the Spirit, let every dark, evil, depressing, controlling, manipulative, confusing, judgmentalism be shunned and thrown away from us. Lord, lead us by your Spirit. We want to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. That's been this session. And I look forward, next time we're going to start talking about vision as we're hearing the voice of God, how we receive a vision and the clarity of the God-given vision. So please continue in the series with me. God bless you.